what did you want to be when you grew up? A question that we've been asked many times from our parents, our friends, and most importantly, of ourselves. A question so important that myself and a group of university colleagues tried to make this into a business to help young people in their transition to working life. Of course, we failed pretty spectacularly. But in doing so, we found something quite interesting. The people who had long-lasting career success were the ones who were able to consistently adapt and reskill themselves to meet the changing nature of work. My name is Lisa Lyons, and I work with organizations to develop their people in line with the current and future requirements of work. Today, I'm here to challenge your beliefs about what it means to have a career in an era of longevity. It is established that we are living longer. Let us look at the change in the last 40 years alone. Most countries have experienced an average increase of 10 or even 20 years added to life expectancy during this period. And longer lives mean longer careers. And as said in the fantastic book, 100 Year Life, children born today may delay settling into their jobs and have an explorer phase between 18 and 30, and then change several times in what could be a 50 year plus career journey. Now let's contrast this with what's happening inside our companies. The evidence clearly shows that the lifespan of companies is shrinking. In 1965, companies in the S&P 500 stayed in the index for an average of 33 years. A figure now forecasts it to shrink to just 14 years by 2026. But the story goes deeper than this. Not only are company lifespans reducing, but there will be more rapid hiring and firing as a result. Here is the UBS trading floor in Connecticut in 2006. It was the world's largest trading floor with a physical size equivalent to 44 tennis courts. And maybe lesser well known, but the Royal Bank of Scotland had a similar size trading floor just across the road. But by 2016, the financial crisis had already hit and the two banks were bailed out by their respective governments and both downsized dramatically. High-touch stockbroker-style voice trading roles were actually replaced by far fewer low-touch electronic roles. But so what? This story in and of itself is a bit of a cliche. The interesting aspect becomes clearer when you overlay the message from the graph before. The data is showing us that we're going to see more and more of these types of stories happening at a faster pace as lifespans reduce of these companies. But it's not just jobs that are changing in number, it, there's also a more nuanced shift in terms of what organizations expect of their employees. A great example can be seen in the recent Oscar winning documentary, American Factory, which shows the changes to manufacturing life in Ohio, USA. It provides dramatic insights of how a company's owner and their workers view American employees in terms of both their skills, their work ethic, and also the cultural expectations of them in their manufacturing operation. This documentary also portrays how people can actually get their jobs back, but the expectations can change of what's actually expected of them in their roles. The real world consequence for people is a decrease in job security and an increased chance of redundancy across a longer career span. For instance, a study conducted by the UK Association for Accounting Technicians showed that almost 50% of respondents have now faced redundancy at least once in their career. But while this sounds quite scary, it doesn't have to be. There is so much hope and opportunity. Arguably never before have we had so many opportunities to learn and access information about what people actually do in their roles. 
The work that I do builds upon the idea that embracing new and different ways of thinking about your career actually puts you in a much better position to navigate through these changes. In my field, we think of three aspects needed to be able to actually do a job. One is the knowledge, which is the facts, the foundations and the principles needed to do that job. Two, the abilities, both the physical and cognitive capabilities needed to do a job. And three is skills, both the portable skills that can be transferred across different jobs and also the specialized skills that are needed for a specific function. As job requirements evolve over time, skills will actually be more important than your label of the job. However, in reality, what we do for a living forms part of our identity. For instance, we might view ourselves as a science teacher or a newspaper editor. However, this kind of title can actually obscure the recognition of the valuable component skills involved in this job, such as data analysis or giving presentations. By only viewing yourselves within the confines of a job title, you may actually be limiting your potential to develop new skills or transition to new roles in the future. A fascinating piece of research found the foundation for young Australians completed an analysis of over 4 million job advertisements to understand the requirements in the new world of work. This extensive research found that employers were demanding more and more portable or transferable skills than ever before. At the same time, they found that jobs were actually more related than you may think as jobs actually share similar transferable skills. And they have put forward this idea that we can identify ourselves and locate ourselves within seven distinct skills clusters. These are generators, artisans, designers, informers, technologists, carers, and coordinators. And if you think about it, this opens the door to opportunity. It illustrates that you could actually move within different roles within your skills cluster as they share similar portable skills. For example, jobs like policy analysts or teachers or statisticians are all from the informer cluster, which have overlapping skills in analysis, critical thinking and problem solving. But at the same time, we shouldn't think about the need for reskilling or personal intervention as a requirement only for the young or the middle-aged, or even just in relation to employment. The increased role of technology in our society means the modalities of engagement are changing. What I mean by this is, for example, older people might find it, find, find it more progressively challenging to keep pace with societal expectations. For example, using internet banking services as high street branches reduce in number or even registering for essential medical services online. You can see here that the requirement to upskill is actually essential to get by in everyday life and for all of us. It's great to see a new international movement called the University of the Third Age, which aims to focus on education and engagement for mainly retired members of the community, those in the third age of their life and even my parents have joined in Northern Ireland. Here, you can take part in activities such as mathematics for grandparents, web design and Arabic. It's also not just job seekers that need to change their mindset. In cases where employers face particularly skill shortages, it would be prudent for them to actually consider a broader range of sources for these transferable skills. For example, you could hire a retail salesperson to fill the vacancy of a hospitality manager as because they actually share similar transferable skills. So, with people living longer and company lifespans reducing, I can see two approaches that could really help us be successful in navigating what could be a 50 year plus career. One, Focus on upskilling yourself 
by learning new and related skills to help you stay relevant. And two, leverage the platform of your own transferable skills, but also inquire, acquire entirely new skill sets to allow you to move to new roles in the future. So if you're interested in staying relevant or reskilling for a new role, you'll need to get really good at both learning and developing new skills throughout your whole career. Through my work in large-scale learning and development, I've observed a number of important elements needed for learning and behaviour change to actually stick. One is motivation. Those with a clear motivation about why they want to learn are more likely to succeed. And if you think about it, previously, we needed motivation throughout our adolescence for a time-intensive education or qualifications. But now a shift is needed to motivate us to integrate learning with life and work on an ongoing basis throughout our lives. Two is practice. It takes sustained and deliberate practice to build up knowledge and skills over time. And it needs to happen regularly in our everyday life. And three is learning from others. This is the one I've seen the most progress in my work. First, learning from others leads to more personal accountability and increases chances of your success. And secondly, people, who, people can actually challenge each other and build on each other's ideas to gen generate new insights and knowledge. One great example is of, of corporate learning is a company called CD Projekt Red which is a Polish video game developer, publisher, and distributor based in Warsaw. Known for their recent game, The Witcher 3, they have gone from a company making Polish translations of games to making some of the best games in the world. Along with harnessing their uniquely Slavic identity for their source material, The Witcher, they have focused on developing a culture of learning in the company to vastly improve not only the output, but game quality. And interestingly, over the last decade, you can see they have experienced more relative share price growth than Netflix, Amazon, and Apple combined. Looking back to when I was young and thinking about that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a teacher like my mother but I also felt this intense pressure to choose the right career and was envious of those who clearly knew what they wanted to do in their lives. Now my advice for my younger self would be not to worry as much. The job title is not as important. Focus on your skills, your interests and your strengths. What you do is likely to change over time. You will need to add new skills as you go, and you'll have more options available to you. Building a career for longevity is different. Instead of thinking about your career as a, as a ladder, think about it like a climbing wall, where there are different routes available to you. You will need to know what truly motivates you, how you learn best, and make the most of learning from others around you. Changing the conversation about careers would also reduce the pressure on the young and puts greater onus of learning and acquiring skills throughout our lives, with the ultimate goal of providing more fluid careers suited to longevity and the changing requirements to work. Thank you.